Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 97, we're going to talk about the cathode and cathode rejuvenation. And stay till the end, I've got some amazing tubes to show you. But first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So before we get into today's episode, number 97, we should talk about episode 100, which is coming up really soon. We wanted to do something fun and different. So what we came up with is a Q&A episode. If you've ever had a question you wanted to ask us, such as why are there 6 volt and 12 volt tubes? Or what is our second favorite EO34? Well, the RFT and the True Svetlana tie for second, in my opinion. Or what did Charles do before he joined Valves and More? Computers, of course. <laughs> I mean, he, he designed and built the store, so uh, that's not surprising. Uh, then ask away. Please use the comment section below and submit your questions. Try and pick questions that don't involve a whole episode to answer. Though, put them up if you want, and maybe we'll make an episode at a future date. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the cathode. Now, it might sound like a really boring subject, but without a cathode, a good working cathode, you got nothing. So, let's talk about what it is, what it does, how it works, and most importantly, why sometimes it gets into trouble. Okay, here's a diagram of a beam-powered tetrode. You've seen me use this before, and we've got in here we got a diagram of the basic types of power of tubes that are available, but here's a cutaway that I really like to use. So here's our cathode right here. And you can see the, what they're depicting is our emissions, our electrons, flowing from the cathode to the plate. Now, the rest of this diagram shows one grid section wrapped around and another grid section. There can be uh, multiple grids depending on the tube design. If it's a simple triode like a 6SN7 or a 12AX7, there's only one grid wire wrapped around. If it's a complex power tube, like a beam powered tetro, there's multiple grid wires wound around. Now what you don't see is the heater or the filament. Now that is the key to the emissions, of course, because these tubes are thermionic emission valves, right? And that just means that you heat the suckers and they send out electrons. So the filament is always in the middle and the cathode is always wrapped around it somehow. There's all kinds of different ways of doing this. If you look at a tube you can probably see it and I'll show you one in a minute. I think we can see through to the filament. So we put a lot of heat on this filament. Some of them gl will glow just like the sun. They get so bright. The, the cathode is negative. The plate is positive. Electrons are attracted to a positive plate. Put a lot of heat on this. Put a special coating on the cathode that's designed to emit maximum uh, quantities of electrons. And they're going to flow. That's how it works. Now, um, Charles is going to talk to us a little bit about what happens to the cathode when it gets into trouble. And this is just a natural part of how a tube operates and what happens over time. Okay, so we know that cathodes emit electrons. What can stop that from happening? Well, gas buildup. As, uh, as I'm sure you all know, a vacuum tube is a vacuum. It's designed to keep gas molecules out. And that's why we have gettering materials, the shiny flash uh, substance that you see on the inside of the glass. They are designed to absorb stray molecules. And it's part of the normal construction process for them to flash off the getter 
and for that to absorb the excess gas. Here's a good example. Yeah, so here's an excellent example. You can see, oh, let me get that in frame there and in focus. Look at that shiny flashed off getting material. Now that's normally barium or some other very reactive metal. And that will absorb gas as the molecules hit it. So the technology behind pulling a strong vacuum has gotten better over the years. The older the tube is, generally the worse the vacuum was, and so the more gathering they had to use on it. The longer a tube will sit, the more gas will build up on the inside and the less is being absorbed by that gathering. And that gas has to go somewhere. What's inside the tube? Well, there's the different electrodes, including the cathode. The gas molecules build up on it and create a coating that actually prevents these electrons from flowing out. Sometimes it's lowering emissions, and other times it's causing noise. Aha! Uh -huh. And that brings me to a, two stories. So, this is a Soviet equivalent to the 6L6. And this story isn't really about the tube, but it's about the order. So I brought in from my wholesaler somewhere in Eastern Europe, I brought in a whole pile of these. And they were all new old stock. They were bulk pack tubes. They look great. Uh, I believe they were from the 70s. And I live tested them right away as soon as they came in. Well, electrically tested them. But I wanted to do a, I did a sampling of a few as, in live testing just to make sure they were okay. And they were noisy. The first one, the second one, the third one, they had a little low crackling noise. So I sent the wholesaler a note right away and he said those tubes of Jim they've been sitting in a warehouse for 50 years the cathodes need to have some heat put on them and they'll rejuvenate and they'll be just fine and I thought what BS is that anyways um, you know in this business you're always learning so I plugged them in and put them on for 20 minutes and lo and behold they were dead quiet I thought this is crazy so I plugged the next one the next one they all became dead quiet so he was exactly right, and that, that was my first experience um, with cathode rejuvenation. Now, move forward to just a few days ago. Well, this story starts maybe a year ago, and I found some of the best 6SN7s ever made. This is the Melts Metal Base 1578, and you can always recognize this tube by what I call the machine gun plate in which it looks like the barrel of a machine gun. It's got all those little holes up there. Let me see if I can get it nice and close for you. The Melts Metal Base 6SN and 6SL7 equivalent to North American tubes are some of the best tubes ever made, bar none, and this was probably one of the best 6SN7s ever made. Now, it's not a boom boom tube. You know, you plug it in and all of a sudden, you know, crappy music, um, crappy recordings sound great. No, it's not a tube like that. It just does everything superbly well and it has excellent detail. And for audiophiles, that's all we want. Anyways, I had plugged these in when they arrived and did a noise test because they cost a fortune, even wholesale. And that means that I ticked them. I always tick them if they've had a live test and they've cleared. And then they went into storage. Um, the, I don't play very expensive high value tubes every day in my system for fun. I mean, it would be nice if I could, but these are customers tubes. They're new old stock um, and I'll put in a couple of hours of listening tests on them to make sure they're good, but that's it. I park them. I want all those hours to go to whoever can afford them, <laughs> which is fair. Anyways, I sold them a few days ago. I put them in the amp as a quick test to make sure everything was okay. And one of the tubes was noisy on the left channel. Not noisy in the sense that, you know, if you're sitting in your listening chair, it was going crackle, crackle. But if you put your ear up against the speaker, you could hear it very slightly. And I thought, I think maybe this cathode needs to be rejuvenated. So I ran them for about an hour. You don't need to put a signal on the tube. I just ran them on. I, basically, I lamped them. If you have a tube tester, you can lamp them in the tube tester. And an hour later, it was dead quiet. And I've done a few follow-up tests, cold starts, we call them. 
and it's still dead quiet. So what happened was in storage over that, I don't even remember how long I've had it, six months, a year, but long enough anyways that the cathode had become somewhat contaminated. And heating it up, Heating it up restored it. It burned off those uh, excess molecules and uh, and gave us back a clean electron flow. So, does this always work with a noisy tube? In my experience, if you've got a tube that looks like it's been to war and back again, that looks like it's spent 25 years working hard in an amp, can you regenerate a tube like that? Probably not. It's probably been worn out and it belongs in the garbage. But if you have a good looking tube, that's testing high, that gets a little tiny bit crackly, try that. Park the tube in an amp, turn it on. You don't need to have any music on. Just leave it running. I never leave my tube gear running unattended. That's my house rule. I strongly suggest you follow that. It's just a good safety procedure. Who knows what's going to happen. Maybe the cat's going to sit on your amp. Um, but anyways, uh, hopefully that helps everybody save a few noisy tubes. Okay, so what's been going on over at Melatone Kits, Charles? Well, we've continued development on our headphone amp. And? and well, and, uh, so yesterday we were working away at it, bright and early. Well, hang on, let's back up. Oh, okay, well, let's back up. We got to version 1.1 and? Version 1.1 and it sounded fantastic. We have some um, magnetic planars that uh, a good uh, customer and supporter of uh, Valves and More and Melatone kits just dropped off one day. Uh, big shout out to uh, Bernie. You know who you are, Bernie. Um, and the you know the headphones look a little beat up, but we put new pads on it. I got a new headband on order. I've got a new new cord on order, and. Um, just with the new pads, they just, they're, I'm, I'm just gobsmacked at how good planars sound. Yeah, we were blown away by them. This was our ex first experience with planar headphones and they just sounded great. The big problem is we ran all of our standard test tracks that go through the main system and the headphone amp sounded better than the main system. And I'm like, how is that possible? <laughs> Anyways, that's the best. The, now I'm redesigning, for the first time in years, I'm redesigning my custom speakers. So, um, anyways, what happened after that? Well, so it sounded great. We were rolling some tubes in it. They all sounded fantastic. But we did our power test, and we were only getting about one and a quarter watts out of it. And our goal had been, we wanted to get as close to a two watt headphone amp as we could, 2 watts RMS. I, yeah. I think 1.75 would have been perfect, but we needed a little bit more output. Well, from our research, uh, 2 watts should be more than enough to drive absolutely everything out there. So if we can get close to that, then we're going to be happy with it. Yeah, and even 1.5 watts probably drives, what, 90, 90, 95 percent of Something like that, yeah. So we weren't quite getting the amount of power out that we wanted. So we decided to upgrade the power transformer. And that's when the trouble started. That's when the trouble started. So you'll probably notice this video is coming out on a Saturday instead of a Friday. So guess what we were doing all of yesterday? Yes. Well, we have a plan. We want to get this, this uh, headphone app moved along. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully today we solve our little wee problem because we're hoping we, we can get the output up closer to two watts and keep that and keep that amazing sound keep with that it. Amazing and, sound. and we want to get back to listening to it so we want to get this thing fixed right away <laughs> okay so what came in this week well as you know we've got thousands of great tubes in transit and finally they're starting to come in so let me clear the decks i'm going to start with we were just talking about melts tubes I've never seen a, you know, a domestic melts box. I've seen the mill spec boxes. I've never seen a real domestic box. And that's probably because they just didn't last that well. Um, most of the melts tubes that I bring in were made in the 50s. So we're talking about 60, 70 year old tubes. Um, and honestly, the Soviets just didn't care about storing stuff and boxes. Some of the tubes I get in look like they might have been in the trunk of a ladder for the last 50 years bouncing around on bad roads. Anyways, 
Uh, the boxes are just gorgeous. There's a little, I don't know if you can see it, but this rim is a little bit of a gold print. And here are the tubes. Now, this is the 6HNC. That's the Cyrillic, uh, but it's essentially a Soviet copy, a direct copy of the 6SL7GT. And they are amazing sounding tubes. They have just a clean, clear sound. They are relatively no noise for a high gain tube. These have a gain of 70. All high gain tubes suffer from the same problem. The noise floor goes up relative to the gain. It's just straight across the board. So if you have a 12AX7 with a gain of 100 or a 6SL7 with a gain of 70, versus, let's say, a 6SN7 with a nominal gain of, let's say, 20, you're going to have three, four, five times the noise floor. It's just the way it works. So, noise testing tubes is really important. Anyways, a whole bunch of these came in, so they're in the store. They are premium tubes. It's very rare that I find uh, melts tubes, new old stock, new in the box, looking absolutely perfect like this. Let me see if I've got a date code on this. Ah, oh, yes, these are all 1056. So, that's all October 1956. Imagine in this condition. Wow, okay, so what's next? Well, a whole bunch of Muller DL34s came in. I'm just going to show you one of the quads. They are absolutely amazing. They're in great shape. Let me get it up on camera for you. Good solid gathering. I, I, you know, I love the sound of the EL34 and the uh, the Muller DL34, the vent, true vintage one from the 1960s into the very early 70s, it beats everything hands down. There are tubes that come close, and we're going to talk about one in just a minute. But let's take a quick look. Because there's so many fakes out there, let's just take a quick look and see what a real, um, a real Muller EL34 looks like, an XF2 series. So there's two types of getters. Now notice how it's on a double stock. So this is a halo getter. It's got two supports. If you see a single support, it's a fake. They've got nice chrome domes. They have got a welded or spot tacked plate. There's no rivets. And if we look on the bottom, there's some giveaways. So let's see if I can get that on focus so you can see it. There's a hole or a manufacturing pin. There it is right in the center of the key. See it? So that is a giveaway as well. And of course there is a code and I've never seen anybody fake the codes. If somebody ever does, we're screwed <laughs> if they can make the same looking too. But anyway, so many of them have had th this etched code often rubs off. Um, unfortunately, some people like to clean their tubes completely and it just disappears. But there's going to be an XF2 if it's visible and there'll be a capital B. And the the capital B is, I never... I believe it's for the Blackburn plant. Blackburn, thank you. I always forget these things. That's why Charles is here. So that's one version. Made in the same years, the same XF2 series. Everything else is identical except that they put small a pair of small halo getters up on the top. The tubes sound identical. The gettering on the double halo tends to be a little less than the single halo, but other than that, everything else is identical. So watch out when you buy these tubes. You never know. It's just crazy what people are trying to pass off as a premium tube. So, talking about premium EL34s, I've got the next best thing to a motor. Here, I'll clear these guys off. Oh, thanks, Charles. Now, for a long while, I was able to find a lot of these tubes. This is the true vintage Svetlana. And they had Svetlana, there's a lot of confusion online. Svetlana had a direct copy from a competitor compete with them uh, sometime starting in, I think, the late 90s, early 2000s. And there was even a big legal battle over who owned the, the rights to the logo in the United States, which would be the biggest market for these tubes, probably. And as a result, uh, new sensor that that uh, has 
has some of the rights. I don't know how to say it. Anyways, I'm not going to get into this, the whole legal rigmarole. New Sensor makes a, co a close copy of this Svetlana tube. Svetlana itself in St. Petersburg closed down in the early 2000s. So all that's left is what we can find, um, the remnants of old, old stock, and mostly all we have really are the used tubes. So I found um, a, a quad, new old stock, new in the box, with gold lettering, which is not that common with the true Svets, but I've got a really quite an old version of it, and I'll show it to you. So here's a, an old logo with the flying C. This is, I don't know what year this is from. It's probably got a date somewhere. Anyways. It's a beautiful logo though. Isn't it? Now normally the later tubes had a much smaller version of this, but notice how it's in gold. Now for a long time uh, the St. Petersburg factory supplied EL34s to guitar amplifiers, tube guitar amplifiers, manufacturers, sorry, uh, Marshall among them. And that those tubes sometimes had the silver or white labels or black labels, uh, but quite often they put gold lettering on them. So, and here's the other side. This is sort of the more modern logo. So this is kind of an interesting tube, how that ended up like that. Um, anyways, um, so let's take a quick look at these. They are double gettered with saucers, very common for a Soviet tube. They're almost always offset like this. And when you offset the getters, you offset the chrome domes. You see how that works? Kind of neat. If you look at it from the other perspective, it's full. And the tubes, the, the, the reissues and the various fakes that are out there, some of them are really quite close. So this isn't, let me get the logo up so you can see, this is the stylized S that is the logo that Svetlana went back to. It's an old logo that they used to use years ago, but when they lost the rights to use the Flying C in the United States, they switched to the stylized S logo and the later production tubes all have this. So this is the real Svetlana tube. Unfortunately, the copies are really quite close, so it's tough to point out details. But if you've got a date in the 90s and you've got the stylized S, there's a very good chance you've got exactly what you think you've got, which is a St. Petersburg EO34. And if you've got an older Flying C logo like this, let me grab one, you know almost certainly that you've got, and even the later logo, if you've got a date into the 90s, it's a very good chance you have the real McCoy. The bad news is that the copies don't sound anywhere near as good as these. These, I, it's been a while since I've listened to the Svetlanas in my system, and of course I have to do it. I had to do a live test to make sure that they were good, and wow, I couldn't believe it. I had just listened to the Mullards. I listened to actually two or three quads of Mullards, um, doing doing my you know required live test and. Uh, Somebody's got to do it. Uh, and I put these on last and I thought, wow, those, those compete quite favorably with the Mullards. And Mullards, you know, the mid-range is impossible to beat, but these came really close. So there's one new old stock quad in the store. Um, and they won't last long, of course. Okay, well, uh, if you've stayed to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got uh, flat rate shipping of $20.00 on um, all of our orders. And if you have an order over $150 after discount, the shipping's on us. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.